And we are going to look at these active works of Christ in our world today and through His church. And before we begin, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father, I thank You for these that have gathered together in Your name tonight. Father, their commitment and their love for You, I pray that You will bless not only in their lives, but in their understanding of who You are in them. Father, thank You for Your constant active work in us. Whether we see You working or we don't see You working, You're always actively working. Father, give us eyes to to see and ears to hear what You are saying to Your church. And guide us in these days. As chaotic as things that are around us, I pray that we will block those voices out and hear from You. You have a desire for us to grow and to work and to live and to be Your light in this world. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be that light. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. The world around us, if you haven't noticed, is in chaos. Would you not all agree with that? And it's hard to it's hard to know when we sing songs like He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. And we know that because He lives in our heart. But it's hard to know that Christ is actually living and active when we don't see Him working. Because we do. We, we serve a risen Savior, but He's not a, a visible Savior. He is in the spirit realm, but He is also, of course, indwelling us. But it's hard to see when what we do see is chaos, that God is actually at work. Well, many believe that once Jesus ascended into heaven, He's sitting at the right hand of God His Father, and He in essence is waiting to come back for His bride, which is us. The church. Well, that's not entirely true. Is He just sitting there, just doing nothing? Is He stagnant, just waiting on the beck and call of His Father to go forth and get His children His bride, to tell them to come up here for us to go home with Him? Or is He actively doing something? Jesus is not just waiting. Jesus is actively working. Whether you see Him or you don't see Him, Jesus is actively working today within His body. So the question becomes, What is Jesus actively doing today? Well, this portion of Scripture, verses 1 through 12, and really, uh, rather, 12 through 16 of Revelation chapter 1, John receives this richly instructive vision of the present, current, active work of the glorified Christ. We need to know this, church. If we are aware that Christ is actually working not only through us, but around us, it should give us a desire to serve Him even more. It's not someone we're going to face in the future. We are facing Christ now. He sees us. He knows your heart. He knows why you're working for Him or against Him. He sees all of this. Well, this vision that John receives, it discloses seven aspects of Jesus' active ministry in His church today. We've talked about three in great detail. And and I I really want to finish these seven tonight. And I know you're thinking, oh, seven? Seriously, David? We've got a Super Bowl that's starting in 30 minutes. Well, I I really want to go through the first several quickly just to remind us to keep it in its context. But I want you to see when you walk out of this building tonight, that you are very aware that Christ is actively working not only in this body, but within you. He has a desire for you and a work for you. And I hope that you see that in our portion of Scripture tonight. 
Well, the first work that we see that Christ is actively doing is that He empowers His church. We wouldn't still be around if it wasn't for His power. It would have ended long time ago when Christ died and rose again if He didn't continuously empower us. We find this in verses 12 and 13 of Revelation chapter 1. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. And we remember we saw that John sees first this seven golden lampstands, which is a representative of us, the church. He didn't see just the one standing in the midst of them. He sees that him second, but he sees the church. The church is active. The church is alive. It's the bride of Christ. He's, I don't know how you feel about Men, I don't know how you feel about your bride, or ladies, I don't know how you feel about your husbands. I love mine. I told you, I make my plenty of mistakes, and I get the big eye, but I still love her, and she still loves me. Sometimes she loves me all the time, but she, sometimes she likes me. That's even better. You know what I'm talking about, Keith. So if you're unsure about what is represented by the seven golden lampstands, if you skip down to verse 20, it it reveals what it is. It's the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. And lampstands symbolize the lights of the world. That's who we are. But also notice how it's, and this is what we talked about, it's the, the church is described as being golden. And there was a purpose for that because gold was a, it was a precious commodity. It was It was something that was very valuable. And to God, the church is valuable. You don't feel like that at times. You know, you're getting beaten up by Satan, our enemy, and you just don't feel like God's even in control at all. But He is. He is. Because you're still here. You're still working. You still desire to work for Him. And to prove that the church is valuable to God, what does He do? His active motion towards this love that He has for us is that He sends His Son, sheds His blood for the church. So He empowers us. And then John goes on to say that in the midst of the seven lampstands is one like the Son of Man. This is the glorified Lord of the church, moving and working in His church. It's an active ministry of Christ. He's always at work in His church. The second work, quickly, is that he intercedes for his church. I'm glad someone's interceding for me. I, you know, if there's not one active ministry of Christ that is any more precious to me, it's this one. It's intercession. I I need someone to have my back. I don't know about you, but I mess up plenty. And I know when I mess up plenty. And I'm Very blessed to know that I have this knowledge that Christ is interceding for me. You find this in verse 13. Clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded about the chest with a gold golden band. So he notices, John does, the one that's standing in the midst of the lampstands is he's clothed with this garment that's all the way down to his feet. Now again, robes back in this century were worn by royalty. They were worn by not only royalty, like princes and kings, but they were also worn by prophets. But the word translated robe here is is frequently used in the Old Testament to to describe the robe that's being worn by the high priest. And we know that Hebrews talks about this in in extensive detail about Christ being our high priest. And we think, but what's, you know, we can't associate that term because we don't have priests in the church. And we don't understand the gravity of what this is. I mean, you have a pastor, but you don't have a high priest. Well, Christ Himself is the high priest. And it shows throughout the book of Hebrews about this role that He plays as a high priest. I mentioned these to you last week, but let me just quickly go through them. Because these are extremely important roles. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 is that Christ makes propitiation. Which means it's... In essence, it's a word of appeasing. It's the taking the place of. He atones for the sins of His people. 
Thank God that the high priest called Christ, my Christ, your Christ, the head of the church, He atones for your sins. Hebrews 2.18 He Himself has suffered. Being tempted, He's able to aid those who are tempted. Have you ever walked through temptation? Church? Yes, you have. There is a high priest, your high priest, the head of the church, which is Christ Jesus, who's been tempted more than you ever have or ever will. He knows what you are dealing with. You can come to Him. Hebrews 3.1, He is the high priest of our confession. Verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 14, He has passed through the heavens so we can hold fast our confession. You know that Christ is already in heaven. He's already achieved that. You know, I, I even on an earthly level, I, if I'm going to follow someone on an earthly level, I want to know that they've achieved some status. I want to know that they've achieved something I'm trying to look up to. Job-wise, if it's someone that's telling me or giving me instruction, I want to know that they've been through that, they've already achieved exactly what I am looking for or trying to achieve myself for them to give me advice. Christ has done that. You want to know how to get to heaven? Your high priest shows that he's already done it. You go to him. Hebrews 7.25, he's also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He saves you. These are important roles the high priest played. Hebrews 9.11, he's the high priest of the good things to come. You know that this, is, this life is only temporary? The best is yet to come. That is a true statement. Hebrews 9.12 He has entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption so we can receive redemption. He paid for the sins. His role of high priest is extremely important. Third work. We looked at this last week also of Christ is that He purifies His church. He makes us clean. Revelation 1, 14 and 15. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. He moves from Christ's attire to his actual person. He starts describing who he sees in this vision. Well, the first few features that John is describing is Christ's work of chastening and purifying His church. Yes, we do get in trouble, church. And when He punishes us, thank God it's only purifying us here on this side instead of eternal damnation and wrath on the other side. I'd rather take a spanking from my dad than I would end up paying some price sitting in a jail cell because he didn't get my attention. Does that make sense? That's exactly what this is. But to a much farther extreme, but He has holy standards for us. And this is why the standards, we look at the Bible and think, how can we live up to this? These standards are high because He has high expectations from us. And when we don't achieve those, He gives us a spanking for us to get right back onto the right path. And 1 Peter 1.15 and 16 says, But as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. That's the standard of Christ for you. Does it matter how you live? You better believe it does. Does it matter how you think? You better believe it does. The next feature John describes is Christ's head and His hair being white like wool, white as snow. And again, we talked about this being His eternal, glorious, holy truthfulness. He's just describing Christ and His in His beauty, and His majesty. Then He talks about His eyes like the flame of fire. He's searching and He's revealing. He knows exactly why you are serving and what you are, your whole motive behind service. Is it what purpose? Christ sees straight through you. So we move on to the fourth work of Christ. Is that He speaks authority to His church. Verse 15, the last part of 15, and his voice 
as the sound of many waters. We talked about this last week. You said, David, you left out many waters. We hadn't got there just yet. Here we are. First time we hear the voice of Christ in this vision, you see in verse 10, and I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet. Well, now this trumpet, which is so clear and with clarity, I don't know if you've heard a trumpet blow, but they are, you know when a trumpet blows. It's very distinctive. Well, now John hears Christ's voice like the sound of many waters. You ever been to Tennessee? You, I, I, there is something about listening to that water come down that mountain, through those streams. But if you get close enough to those, and this is, we're talking about something that's very narrow. It is loud. It's, it's deafening. I remember my wife and I were walking uh, just a couple weeks ago and and this was right after the hard rain that we had that passed through. And just through the ditches, it was coming down off of a, like a, a little bank, and it was hitting that, the water that was down in the bottom of that ditch. And it was, just in itself, we stopped and we filmed it. And, but just to listen to that, the sound of rushing water, is, it's deafening. It's powerful. There's a sense of authority to that. There is no stopping running water. You ever you can put stand, sandbags up all you want. If water's coming, water's coming. And it's not going to stop until it flows through. Well, later in Revelation, we will hear the same description of Christ's voice in chapter 14, verse 2, when I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder. And then Revelation 19, 6, and I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters there's not a whole lot of sound with authority that sounds greater than rushing water. That's how John is describing his voice. Well, by now John was familiar with the sound of crashing waves and sounds of la loud sounds of many waters because he heard the daily surf crashing onto the shores of Patmos. And I'm sure over the 18-month period that he was on that island, Quite sure a storm or two came through, and there was probably some vivid uh, memories and in, in, of these sounds of this water that's crashing along this this shore of that of that island. But the voice of God was similarly described in the Old Testament, Ezekiel chapter forty-three. And behold, the glory of of God of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters. But what does it mean? What does it mean that, that the sound of many waters is, is rushing? And what is John even actually trying to describe? Well, the voice of sound of many waters is the voice of sovereign power. That's Christ. Don't ever get the idea that Christ has been weakened or that he's not in control or that the world is in chaos and we have no hope as believers. I'm saying to you that Christ, who is the head of the church, is in complete control of what's going on even in 2024. It has to get chaotic before he returns. All of these signs must be completed before he returns. So the voice is a sound of sovereign power, the voice of supreme authority, the voice that will one day command the dead to come forth from the graves. It's His voice that speaks. God's voice has the power to make anything come to pass. When He speaks, things happen. Remember that old commercial? What was it? Uh, um, there was an old commercial back in like the 80s. Um, yeah, what was that? Yeah, when something speaks you know, and it goes silent, everyone starts listening. Y'all know what I'm talking about. No, it wasn't Merrill Lynch. E.F. Hutton. When E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. Yeah, well, I'm just saying to you that when Christ speaks, people listen. His church listens. God's voice has supreme power. John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear His voice in the graves. And come forth, those who have 
done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of the con condemnation. The voice will be heard of Christ calling them out of the grave. That's power. That's power. Christ's voice will eliminate His enemies in the battle of Armageddon. I mean, do you really think that in the battle of Armageddon, when, we, when Christ comes on this horse and we are, we don't have any armor, we don't have any weapons, all we are are onlookers of Christ as He comes to do battle against all those millions of people that are still left that is, the Antichrist is going to come, he's going to punch Jesus in the face, and he's going to take over the world, and then Jesus speaks. It's done. That's power. Revelation, look, Revelation 19, 13, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God, and the armies in heaven, yoo that's us, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, that's us, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. You don't think he's just like shooting projectiles of swords, do you? No. It's imagery. It's his word. It's his voice. But David, why do you think that the word is Jesus and, the, and, and this sword is the word of God? Well, let me just give you the scriptures for that. John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God, which means it was Christ Himself. Let me go on. Matthew 10, 34. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. You know what that sword is? It's the Word. The Word cuts. Hebrews 4.12 for the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. When He comes and speaks, the enemies are eliminated. Ephesians 6.17 and take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Is that, is that clear enough? No, well, I'm not done yet. Revelation 1.16, He had in His right hand seven stars. Out of His mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and His countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Revelation 2.12, And to the angel of the church of Pergamos, write, these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. That is the Word. It's the Word of God. In Revelation 2.16, and I'll move on, Repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. <laughs> you want to know what eliminates? You want to know what's powerful? It's His voice. That's why John heard it sounded like rushing water when he spoke. It was that powerful. The fifth work of Christ is that He controls His church. No matter how chaotic it may seem, He controls His church. Revelation 1.16 He had in His right hand seven stars. And if you skip down to verse 20, the first part of verse of that verse, it says the seven stars, because it, it gives a description of what 16 is. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Well, I think that we firmly establish that Christ is the head of the church, right? Church? Absolutely. And, I, and I'm thankful that we are in a place that we don't argue this point, but there are churches that don't believe this. Well, Christ is the head. And he's also the ruler of the kingdom of God. And he exercises his authority in his church. Acts 20, 28. I know I'm giving you a lot of scripture. I hope that I've remembered to put those, all those down in your notes. But those are for reference. Because I don't want you to think that I'm just coming up with something right out of the blind to fill some time. Acts 20, 28. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to the shepherd the church of God which He purchased with His own blood. I'm saying to you that Christ purchased us. 
You are a commodity of his. You belong to him. Well, I don't like to be owned. (laughs) You're in the wrong place. (laughs) I want to be owned by Jesus. Because he's proven he can do... Do I need to relist all of the things in Hebrews? As a high priest, what he's already accomplished? I'm just following him. I want to be owned by him. I wish he was more... I'll be quite frank, I wish he was more active in my life. I I would like for him to make clear decisions for me. That way I can quit screwing up. Don't we all say amen? We are Christ's church. He purchased us with His blood. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You belong to Him. Well, in John's vision, Christ is holding in His right hand seven stars. You see that? It's identified, verse 20, as the angels of the seven churches. And if you're wondering, what do angels have to do with anything? (laughs) I mean, where did that come from? (laughs) It seems like that's just like a shot in the dark and just throwing some random statement up because I haven't heard about anything of any churches being owned or run by angels. Isn't that kind of confusing? Well, angels symbolize messengers of Christ. That's what they are. They are Christ's messengers to the church. And the statement he had in his right hand doesn't portray safety and protection. It portrays control. If I have... If I'm holding on to this book in my right hand, that means I have control over what happens to this book. I can throw it at you. I can hand it to you. I can place it down. But it just means that I have control over something. The church is under Christ's control. John sees that. And the statement is talking about angels. And this word angels is described as angelio. Now, angelio is the Greek word, and it's common in the New Testament for angels. That's where we get this interpretation from. But it leads some, if you're not looking at this correctly, to conclude that angels are in view of this passage. That angels are somehow in control of these churches. But what have I always said over the 14, 15, what have we established? 14 and a half. Three quarters. Just like my height. I'm 5'10 and 3 quarters, but on my driver's license, I am 6 foot. Well, if something doesn't make sense, seems to contradict another scripture or teaching, you need to dig. Because there's nothing in the scriptures that contradict one another. So nowhere in the New Testament does it teach that angels are involved in the leadership in the church. So obviously it can't mean what it says on the surface level. Angels, for one, do not sin. You find me anywhere in Scripture where it says they do. And thus, they have no reason to repent. They don't repent as the messengers, along with the congregations that they resent, are exhorted to do. They bring messages to them, but it's not, the the angels don't sin. Well, let me, because you're looking at me with some confusion on your face, let me give you some examples from the Scriptures to show you what I mean. Revelation 2, 4 and 5. Nevertheless, I have sent, I have this against you, that you've left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Let me just ask the simple question Who is called to repent? The church or angels? The church is. It's not speaking about angels. They're talking about the church. If angels are the representatives of the church, then why would they be required to repent? So it it obviously cannot mean what it says on the surface. Let me give you another one. Revelation 2.14 But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. 
Well, let me just be quite frank. Angels don't hold the doctrine of Balaam. People do. The church did. And angels do not teach Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel. People do, not angels. So it was the church and it was false teachers in the church that did this. Revelation 2.20 Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Angels don't allow the woman Jezebel to teach them. Right? So you, it's all of that. If you think that it's angels that are represented here, you're mistaken. It's talking about the churches. And I've given, uh, there's Revelation 3, 1 through 3, and 15, 17, and 19, all deal with the same thing. But I'm not done, because I just want you to be sure that, David, you're not just coming up with something silly. If you interpret that angels are representing the churches, why would Christ send a message to angels through John? Why? John's an earthly vessel. Why would God send a message that he wanted the angels to know through John, who was, a, who was on an island being as a criminal, <laughs> being punished? That's, so it can't be. My point is, angels is better understood as messengers, like any other place in the Scripture. They're just messengers of the church. So these messengers are sending messages to the leading elders and pastors in the seven churches. That's how you need to read that. Revelation 1.16, he had in his right hand seven stars, and the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. You can just better interpret this as these verses would be that Christ controls the messages that go to his church. Simple. I know it seemed like it was all the way around this mountain. But you know, when you have comments or statements that look on the surface that it's something else, Always have to look a little deeper. But I want you to understand here also that spiritual leaders are really important because they have a function in within the body of Christ because they are to be instruments through which Christ, who is the head of the church, mediates His rule. We need as leaders of the church to hear from Christ. We need to be diligent about our calling, diligent about listening to what our leader is saying to us. That's why the standards for leadership in the New Testament are so high. This is not something to be taken lightly. And I, I know I don't need to be keep looking at Delus because this is what he will be going into as of next Sunday. Taking the oath of, of leadership in a church. That's a heavy calling. And it's something to be taken very serious. And I hope that you as a church body backs him and prays for him just as much as you pray for me. Uh, there is a message, uh, obviously, that Christ wants to use through him to the church. This is extremely important. And the qualifications of the office of pastor is found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-7, through and Titus chapter 1. And I'll move on quickly to these next two, the last two. The sixth work of Christ is that He protects His church. Verse 16, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, which we know is a defense weapon, also an offense weapon. And that sharp two-edged sword is used to defend the church against external threats. But it's not just external. In Matthew chapter 16, it just says that the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Christ protects the church. If he doesn't protect the church, we would have been long gone. Long gone. We are in the midst of the God of this world. And He hates you. Period. But the dangers against the church doesn't just come from external powers. Here, in this at least, in these Scriptures, it's a reference to the dangers that arise within the, the church. False teachers. Those that cause chaos. Those who sow lies and discord. Those that will do these things, will be punished and dealt with by Christ Himself. So I want you to be clear about that. Christ protects His church. And as we've seen, the Word is power. Haven't I given you the Scriptures to show that? When His Word goes out, it has power to it. And that sharp two-edged sword will deal with the problematic people. You can rest assured of that. 
And finally, the seventh work of Christ is that He reflects His glory in us. That's a ministry of Him. He illuminates His light within us to the world. Revelation 16. And His countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Well, John borrowed that phrase, by the way, out of the Old Testament, Judges chapter 5, verse 31. But let those who love Him be like the sun when it comes out in full strength. We want to be like our Jesus. Don't you? That's our desire. We want to reflect His glory. And the glory of God through the Lord Jesus Christ, it shines in and through His church. That's us. Don't think that what you do and who you are is not important. You may not think that you're making a, a great impact on the world around you, but you are a reflection of Christ Jesus. Whether it be to one person, two people, a hundred people, six thousand people, you are a reflection of Christ around you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And the result is, is that He's glorified in us. Is Christ at work today? Yes. Very clearly, He's at work today. Are you saved? You know that that happened a long time after He was on this earth which means that he has an active ministry that still goes on. And people after you will be saved. People after Delus will be called into ministry. We have a work to do, church. I hope that you see that in these Scriptures, in this vision that John receives on this island, is a, is a, is a picture of the glorified Christ. And that he's not just sitting at the right hand of God the Father, waiting to come back for us, but that he's actually working. And he's actually doing a ministry within the body. I hope that you recognize that. It's real. Step out of line and see if it's not real. Please don't test them. <laughs> Please don't test them. Father, I thank you for this truth and this vision that was received by John and pinned on this paper and allowed us to see your glorified state. Not a God that's been crucified, but a God that has risen, a God that is active, a God that is head of the church, a God that has a ministry that is resounding and is active today in 2024. The world is trying to gather our attention away from what you are doing, and I pray that we will be so focused on you, one-minded, on you, that we see your work in us and that we see your work around us. Father, show each one of your people here tonight what you desire for them to do, whether it's a small impact or a great impact. The reason you called them is to be your light. So help us to be obedient to your call, Lord Jesus. When it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. God bless you, church. Thank you all for coming out. By the way, I